Jahu, Kira. Um, thank you, everyone. It's a, it is a real pleasure to be here. This is a special institution, uh, this center. Not only here in the Viv, but uh, worldwide. I don't know a place as creative and as original as this center, so I always feel very happy to be here. I'm going to speak in English. Um, Можно задать вопросы на русском, but unfortunately, uh, I can't speak Ukrainian. I'm learning. Every time I come, I learn some more words. Um, as Ira uh, said, I understood most of what she said. Um, this is what we call a sneak preview. In other words, about uh, a short uh, introduction to a book of mine that will appear in um, October. And it's on, the it's on the fate of people and on the fate of books. Uh, in Vilna, Vilnius, um, before, during, and after the war. Uh, first, and in English it will be called The Book Smugglers. Um, first, I should tell you how I came to this topic. This is not my usual topic. But uh, this book has been part of my life, part consciously or unconsciously, for almost 30 years. Um, in 1989, I was a young, I was the age of many of you here, just finished my doctorate, just got my first job, uh, academic job, and I got a phone call from the YIVO Institute in New York, the Jewish Research Institute in New York, and they tell me, you know, we found, they found, they found mountains of Jewish books and papers in Vilnius, Lithuania. We want to know what it is. Can you come with us to Vilnius, this is still Soviet Vilnius in 1989, and see what it is? Tell us, you know. Uh, so I went with the team. And ever since then, I was interested in the history. And these books and mountains were found in what was formerly a church, formerly a monastery, actually, which was then the Litovska Knizhna Palata. You do have in Kiev a Knizhna Palata, whether you know it or not, a book chamber, a book palace. And uh, I've worked on many other topics, but I always had this in the back of my mind. And then the last few years, I actually researched it thoroughly based on uh, both printed sources and archival sources. And um, that is how I came to the topic. OK, you don't need this map, but in America, they need this map. Uh, yes, uh, Vilna, Jews call Vilna, of course, or Vilnius, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. Uh, Yerushalayim Delita, which is a very a, a evocative, very um, powerful name. Very few communities in Jewish history are called the Jerusalem of. There are three or four other communities. Um, Salonika was called the Jerusalem. Uh, Frankfurt was called the Jerusalem. But Vilna is the Jerusalem of Lithuania. Jews always refer to the region as, as Lita, Lithuania even when it belonged to Russia, and even when it belonged to Poland, this whole region, including Belarus, it was in Jewish geography, um, Lithuania. Yes, in this period, in the northeastern uh, corner of, um, of Poland. Uh, uh, let me, this is the most famous rabbi from Vilna, the Vilna Gaon, Rabbi Elijah of Vilna. On, let me just say before I speak about him, um, on the eve of the war, well, let us say in 1941, before the German invasion, uh, there were 70,000 Jews in Vilna, less than in Lemberg, who live. Uh, uh, it was the fourth largest Jewish community in Poland, after Warsaw, Lodz, Łódź, uh, Lviv, and then Vilna. But like Lviv, about a third of the population, uh -oh. and some years even 40% of the population uh, consisted of, of Jews. 
it, it, numerically, it may not be the most important community. Culturally, it was a very important community. Thanks largely to this rabbi. Uh, briefly, just to say, he, is, he uh, followed a form of Judaism which believed that the most important religious um, aspect of religion is to study the holy books. More important even than prayer, more important than faith, more important than good deeds, the most important, he believed, religious uh, activity is studying the Bible and the other holy books, which he did uh, almost uh, all day and all night, many hours in the day. This devotion, and the reason this is important is because he created a cultural tradition in this community. This kind of devotion to books uh, and to study, which continues after his death and continues even as the community changes. So in the 19th century, this is on the left, Vilna is the center for Hebrew printing, uh, in the Russian Empire, actually the single most important center of Hebrew printing in the Russian Empire. And it, this is a volume of the Talmud, the great uh, religious work of Judaism after the Bible, which was printed, the classical edition of the Talmud is referred to as the Vilna Talmud, Vilna Shas, which was printed in Vilna many times. Uh, by the 20th century, Jewish printing is mainly in Yiddish, not in Hebrew, and it is mainly secular, not religious. Uh, artistic literature, belletristic literature, politics. This is just a selection of Yiddish newspapers in Vilna. In Vilna there were five daily Yiddish newspapers in the 1920s. This tells you many things. Five daily newspapers and 70,000 Jews. Uh, it tells you, first of all, some people are reading more than one newspaper. It also tells you people are reading these newspapers not only in Vilna, but even in Warsaw they are reading Vilna newspapers. Uh, it also tells you that this is a, a politically, ideologically fragmented community because you have a Zionist newspaper and a socialist newspaper and a socialist Zionist newspaper and an orthodox news, religious newspaper and a non-partisan newspaper. This is how you get five daily Yiddish newspapers. Uh, I, I would say, again, this is a city of books. That's how I'm beginning my story. To understand the story, it is a city of books. In the back here, this is a painting of the great synagogue in Vilna. Vilna is not as old as Lviv. As a Jewish community, the synagogue was built in 1572, but that's relatively old. After all, it's further east. Uh, the great synagogue, and in front of it, an unusual institution, the communi Jewish community library. On the budget of the Jewish community was a library called the Strashun Library, uh, founded in 1892. The fact that the library was built next to the synagogue was itself an important statement. That it is a kind of second sanctuary, a very central and important institution. Uh, and this library had um, the other unusual thing about the institution is it was open seven days a week. Even Saturdays, the Jewish Sabbath, uh, the reading room was open, though you could not write notes in the reading room on the Sabbath. And this was an important statement that reading is not a luxury or a leisure activity, it is an integral part of life, and therefore the library is open five, uh, seven days a week. Uh, this is the reading room. It had many rarities. It's mainly a Hebrew library, though it had also uh, Yiddish and uh, Russian and other languages. It had rarities, which is Hebrew books from the 16th century, especially Italian imprints uh, from the 16th century. And it had five Hebrew incanabula, that is, books printed before the year 1500. These are very rare, books printed before 1500. Another great collection is this Yiddish Scientific Institute, YIVO. Uh, in the city, which is mainly a great library, mainly a great archive. 
collected mainly through volunteers. Volunteers sent in um, ephemera. Ephemera is things that people throw away. Posters, theater posters. Uh, news bulletins from a institution. Everything that people throw away, Evo collected. And had a great, great archive of also institutional records. And it is committed very much to the developing the Yiddish language and Yiddish culture. You can see the Yivo, Yivo is short for Yiddish Wissenschaftlicher Institute. Yiddish or Jewish Scientific Institute. Uh, founded in Vilna in 1925. And it had courses for teachers. And here, I think you can see the two main directors of Ivo, Max Weinreich uh, and uh, Zelik Kalmanovich. We'll come back to in a minute. <coughs> Finally, I've talked about printing. I've talked about study. I've talked about printing. I've talked about libraries and scholarship which is Evo scholarship, we have a literary group, writing of modern literature. This is the literary group, Jung Vilna, uh, an, an issue of their journal, which you can see very interesting. You, these are streets from the old Jewish ghetto, the old Jewish quarter, and of course this is a factory. From the Jewish eyes go from right to left, since Yiddish and Hebrew are written from right to left, so you're seeing going, oopsie, going from the old, from the old to the new. And these are two of the most important heroes of my story, these two poets. This poet is Schmerke Kaczerginski. Kaczerginski is a hard name, uh, so I will call him Schmerke. Schmerke is short for Shmariahu, a Hebrew biblical name, Shmaria. Um, something about him. He's a, both his parents died of diseases in World War I. He's, re, he's an orphan. He grows up on the streets, and then he's in an orphanage. So he goes from an orphan without parents, who lives in an orphanage and goes to a school of an orphanage, to become a poet, which is an unusual biography. Uh, and he's everybody's best friend. He is the light of this group, Jung Vilna. And uh, he is a member of the Underground Communist Party in Poland. Uh, he believes that the paradise is across the border to the east in the Soviet Union. Uh, next to him is his friend Avrom Sutskever. Sutskever. Uh, he's born in Smargon, um, spent his childhood in Siberia during World War I. He loved Siberia the snow and the nature, and his first poems are nature poems. He's the grandson of a rabbi from a middle class family, and uh, apolitical, non-political. When asked, he says, My, I only believe in poetry. My only ideology is poetry. And that is his commitment throughout his life, poetry. Okay, now we come. Uh, the German uh, invasion uh, of Vilna is June 24th, uh, 1941. And I want to tell you some general things about the Vilna ghetto. Uh, okay, the Germans come in at the end of June. They create the ghetto at the beginning of September. A few months later, they actually create, as you can see, two ghettos. The ghetto number two lasts only a few months. It's ghetto number one that lasts for two years, from 1941 to 1943. The main thing to know about the Vilna ghetto is that it is, that it is different in certain ways from the Warsaw ghetto, or for that matter, even the Lviv ghetto. Uh, the Warsaw and Lviv ghetto have a very familiar pattern, which is um, gradual deterioration and, gra and then uh, large-scale deportation, but it's gradual. In other words, the living conditions in Warsaw are uh, not so bad in the ghetto in 1940. They are worse in 1941. They are terrible and dramatic in 1942. 
1943, the ghetto is liquidated. This kind of more disease, more hunger, larger deportations. This is the standard narrative of ghettos that we think of. The Vilna ghetto is a different story. The Jewish population of Vilna, because it is a story that the Jewish population of Vilna goes from 70,000 to 40,000 in three months from the end of June till September. Um, 1941, that is only 40,000 Jews go into the ghetto. 30,000 have already been killed. They have been sent to the outskirts of the city to a place known as Ponar in Yiddish, or Panarei, or Ponari in different languages, uh, where they are shot, where they are mowed down in pits and shot. In So the, almost half of the Jewish population is killed in three months. And then an additional 20,000 are killed in the next three months, from until the end of December 1941. So by the end of the year 1941, only 20,000 Jews are left in Vilna. So it's, if you want a very sudden, immediate trauma to this community, it's immediate and it's, it's massive and it's sudden. And then in January 1942, the killing stops. And it will not continue. The massacre will not uh, resume well, you could say at all, it, until the liquidation of the Vilna ghetto, which is in September 1943. In other words, for more than a year and a half, this is what's known as the period of stability in the Vilna ghetto. Uh, its existence is difficult, uh, very difficult even, but people go to work, usually out, they walk outside, they come back to the ghetto at the end of the day, uh, life is grim, but there, and of course, no one has forgotten their friends and relatives that were killed. Everyone is afraid it will return, but it is not returning for that year and a half. And uh, this story I'm going to tell you is from this period of stability. Um, right, this is the gates to the Vilna ghetto. Again, it starts with 40,000. But by most of the period, there are 20,000 inhabitants in all, what is really only seven streets. Of course, this is, a, for us and for everybody, a very dramatic place. Because uh, ghetto inhabitants will try to smuggle food into the ghetto. The official food rations are very small, but actually in the Vilna ghetto, better than the Warsaw ghetto, there's a lot of smuggling of food. Uh, but if you're caught, it, but there's check body checks at the gate. Uh, the gate is manned mainly by Lithuanian police and Jewish ghetto police, but from time to time, German officers do um, personally do body searches at the gate. And that changes the dynamic very dramatically uh, because when there are Germans at the gate, also the Lithuanians and Jews are very strict and very careful and when there are Germans at the gate, people will be beaten badly for carrying potatoes. And people are sent to Ponar. Many people are sent to their execution, to their death, because they carry bread, potatoes, peas um, at the gate. OK, now to get to my story itself. I have to tell you about this organization, if you don't know about it, the Einsatzstabreichsleiter like Rosenberg, which I will call for short the ERR, instead of Einsatzstabreichsleiter. This is one of the main uh, organizations of Nazi Germany for the looting of cultural property. That is, all kinds of cultural property. The ERR was active in France and in Belgium, uh, looting uh, art and, uh, from museums and from private collections. But what you need to know, they work all throughout all of Europe, is one of the ERR's interests was looting Judaica, was looting books in Hebrew and in Yiddish. You may be surprised, but the uh, Nazi Germans had a growing field, academic field, known as Judenforschung, study of the Jews. This was a kind of anti-Semitic Jewish studies. In other words, Jewish studies that would prove that the Jews are depraved, evil, um, an 
enemy of the Aryan race, all through scholarship, through science. So you need, because of this, you need the raw material. You need the books, you need the manuscripts in Hebrew, in Yiddish, so that Judenforschung can uh, succeed and prove uh, scientifically these things. So the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, the ERR, uh, had a top specialist in Judaica, Dr. Johannes Pohl. He was also the librarian of an institute in Frankfurt, known as Institut zur Forschung der Judenfrage, Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question. Paul is also an interesting biography. A devout Catholic, he was an ordained Catholic priest. He studied in Rome, advanced studies after, uh, and then he studied in uh, Jerusalem at the Pontifical Institute in Jerusalem. He mastered Hebrew, both Biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew. He also learned Yiddish well, and he read Yiddish newspapers. And he comes to Vilna for the first time, actually in July 41, very quickly after the army. And he knows what Vilna is. He knows about Evo, and he knows about the Stresur Library, he knows about other institutions. And he's interested in looting the good, valuable material to send to Frankfurt, to the Institute of Forschung der uh, But from his first visit, he realizes there's too much. There are too many libraries. There are too many collections. And it can't be done. It's, too, it's a, a complicated project. How will you, so you can't send everything to Frankfurt. And who can select? what is valuable and what is not valuable. Uh, so eventually, eventually he decides, the slogan of, he decides to hire um, Jewish slave laborers, forced laborers, as a team, and they will sort. They will decide what goes to Germany. And eventually, when the policy becomes firmer, takes a few months. The policy is that valuable things will be to Germany and everything else will be destroyed. It will be sent to um, as, either as maculatura, you know, as trash, uh, or to paper mills, right? To be recycled. Uh, so he, ha he has to create this slave raver brigade of the surviving Jewish intellectuals in the Vilna Ghetto. And they themselves will have to choose what to Germany, what to destruction. He, of course, creates a quota. No more than 30% can go to Germany. 70% uh, will have to be destroyed. The, the head of this slave raider brigade, which gets the name the Paper Brigade, is a librarian. Let me just step back and say, you know, the group consists of 20 intellectuals and 20 technical workers. Technical workers have to make the boxes, have to drag the boxes, have to keep the building maintained, uh, even provide all kinds of services. But there are 20, and they're also Jews, but 20 intellectuals, librarians, scholars, educators, writers, uh, even musicians and artists are the 20 intellectuals that are doing this job. Kruk was a professional librarian from Warsaw. He fled from Warsaw to Vilna in the fall of 19, in September 1939. He is also the director of the Vilna Ghetto Library. As it happens on the territory of the ghetto, there was a Jewish library. Not the Strashun Library, not Evo, but another library. Uh, but with a good collection. He becomes its director. Uh, and yes, the commitment to the book, my whole story is about how the commitment to the book continues. It is a pre-war tradition and it continues even in the ghetto. So that uh, this is a sign, a poster from the ghetto for a public celebration, the lending of the 100,000 book, 100,000 books in the history of the Vilna ghetto. In other words, in one year, a little more than a year, uh, there have been 100,000 book transactions 
in, uh, either people taking home a book or reading in the reading room uh, in the Vilna Ghetto Library. He remains director of the Vilna Ghetto Library, but he now has a second job to head this brigade on behalf of Dr. Paul, Johannes Paul, uh, uh, the, the paper brigade. Quickly, who are other people in the brigade? Zela Kalmanovich, that one of the directors of Evo. Uh, Kalmanovich, uh, Krook was a socialist, a Bundist, that is a social democrat, not a communist, but a social democrat. Kalmanovich, on the other hand, is a Zionist and a religious believer. They get along well in the ghetto in this work, but they do have a disagreement. Krook is the one who says, we must hide whatever we can. We must hide books and papers, documents, manuscripts from the Germans as much as we can. And Kalmanovich surprisingly says, no, we should send as much as we can to Germany because this is a war zone here. Buildings are being destroyed. Whatever stays here is in danger. It will go to Germany, Kalmanovich says, and when the war is over and we win, the Allies win, we will find it and get it back. It is safer in an archive or in an institute in Germany than it is in this war zone. They disagree. And then we have our two poets again, Schmerke and Suske. They are hired into this brigade. And they became the main book smugglers. Uh, what, how do they smuggle books? The most common way is um, at the end of the work day, especially in colder months, but all year long, you have to wrap papers and little books around your body, under your clothing, or under your coat, um, either as like a girdle or like a diaper, and uh, then you will go to the gate. If there are just Lithuanians or Jewish ghetto police at the gate, there will probably not be a problem. But if there are uh, German officers at the gate, then your life is in uh, serious uh, danger. Um, but they do all kinds of amazing things. They do this day after day after day for a year and a half. And it's not only these two, but just about all members of this brigade participate. Uh, one or two members of the technical brigade participate um, because they bring toolkits. They have a hammer, they have a wrench, they have a screwdriver, they have a toolkit. The toolkit has a false bottom, and so that they, at the very bottom, can hide documents or papers. Of course, they have to make quick decisions what to rescue, what not to rescue. Uh, uh, some things are very hard to rescue. Big books or paintings and uh, large items cannot be hidden under your clothing. For that, maybe I'll later explain how that's done. But the smaller things, you still have to make selections. Many of you are historians. You cannot smuggle an entire archive of an institution or of an organization. And it's very hard to select a gem, a, a, a treasure, out of 100,000 pages. Uh, Sutzkever and, and Schmerke and Sutzkever are poets, they do give preference to literary material. That is, um, manuscripts and letters by writers, Yiddish writers, Hebrew writers. But I should tell you, not only, because the Germans learn quickly. They have a wonderful operation here. They have smart, educated people who can process material to Germany, to destruction. And they start sending here not only Jewish material, but uh, especially Russian material, Soviet material, since the Soviets are the great, the second great enemy, the Bolsheviks of the Third Reich. Uh, they're very, so they start sending a lot of Russian material, libraries, and manuscripts, not only from Vilna, but from Vitebsk, and from Smolensk. Uh, in other words, from relatively close places, uh, to be processed here. So Sutskeva and Schmerke start finding uh, surprising things like letters by uh, Tolstoy and Gorky. And yes, Polish material is also sent in here, less um, 
but some Polish materials so that they come across and rescue a document signed by Kaczuszko. Right, which they, so they're getting a lot, and they're, so they're mainly rescuing Jewish material, but they're also rescuing all kinds of other material that's going through this um, work site. This is their friend, the two poets, and their friend, Rachela Krinsky. She's a high school teacher of history with a master's degree from Vilna University. She, in other words, she knows Latin well. She knows she can read old German. So she's very good for all kinds of material. She has a very dramatic personal story. Her husband was killed almost immediately in July 1941. She had, they had one daughter, 18 months old. When the, the ghetto was founded, established in September, she decides not to take her daughter with her to the ghetto. She gives her daughter, 18-month-old daughter, to her Polish nanny, Nyanya, and says, you take care of my daughter, and she goes into the ghetto alone. But she can see from a distance her daughter every once in a while. Because the work site where they are working is outside the ghetto in another neighborhood. And the nanny will sometimes take a carriage with the little daughter down the street so that Rachel can see her daughter from the window. So she can, and even once she gets to see her daughter close because the Germans leave the work site for lunch. And during lunchtime, the area, the work site is not well guarded. So there are visitors during the lunch hour. And once the nanny brought her daughter to her during the lunch hour, but by that point, the daughter didn't recognize that this woman is her mother. A year had passed. From 18 months, it's now 28 months. This is, she is growing up her daughter as a Polish Catholic girl. She, did, she liked this lady that she met, but she didn't know it was her mother. Also, Schmerke and uh, Rachel, both widows, both widows, he lost his wife, uh, developed a romance in the ghetto. And the book sorting begins. This is the materials brought to the train station or taken from the train station. And the moment of truth at the ghetto gate. But there's some, I'll tell you only one, well, two fantastic stories at the ghetto gate. Schmerke does, uh, once takes a big folio volume, uh, rabbinic, old rabbinic literature volume, straight to the gate. And he says to the German guard, um, I must take this in to the ghetto library, which has a bindery, to, because my boss, Dr. Paul, said that the book must be rebound. And then I'm taking it back to work. Of course, the German guard couldn't imagine that this Jew would make up such a story and risk his whole life because of the book. So he believed him and let him in. Um, I have, of course, in the book many stories, but I can't tell you them all now. I'll only tell one more. Rachel, the woman, once tried to smuggle in not a book, but a silver beaker, a silver cup for wine, uh, for blessing over the wine in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Uh, so she had the, a, a silver cup in her pocket. Everyone was sure, because again, there was a German guard at the gate, she is dead. She is going to Ponar immediately. But she takes it out of her pocket and she gives it to the German official and says, this is for you, a present. I brought it for you. And she also gives him a pair of uh, gloves for his wife. He takes the present and for some reason, unexplicably, he was in a good mood, he lets her through. And her wife is saved. I can't tell you all the stories, but there are many. Inside the ghetto, they have to hide the books. They have to bury the books. This is a diagram of a book bunker in the ghetto. This is, well, not only for books, but also for books. A engi construction engineer went down 
through the sewage system, canalizatia, and uh, built a bunker underground even with electricity and with water, and actually two types of material were kept here. Books hidden by the and papers hidden by this brigade, and arms, because uh, weapons, because in the ghetto there is a par underground partisan organization. It wants to have an uprising someday, an armed uprising. It was really built for the partisans, uh, for the FPO. Uh, but the FPO, the partisans agreed to have books there as well. So you have a pile of books and papers and a pile of uh, guns next to each other. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of a map. Again, the Vilna ghetto is small. This is the gate, the entrance. This is the ghetto administration, the Judenrat. This is the ghetto library, where Krupp worked. Um, a lot of books are hidden in the library. Uh, this is that bunker I was telling you about. Of course, maybe the biggest question is, why did they do this? That's the biggest question. And the, I think the answer, there are many answers, about it, but the most important answer is, they all believe they are doomed, they are going to die. And they want to do something good and important before they die or when they die. If they are going to die, they want a reason, a meaning to it. And they would. And of course, it's about commitment to culture. It's about commitment to books, to knowledge, to culture. That is the fundamental thing. That it will all have a meaning if they can accomplish this. And that in the future, somebody will find it. In the future, somebody will find it. Sutskever, being a poet, writes a poem about this experience. In Yiddish it's called Kern Weitz. Right? I'll read it to you and explain one part. As if protecting a baby, I run, bearing Jewish words. I grope in every courtyard. The spirit won't be murdered by the hordes. And I dig and I plant manuscripts as if by despair I am beat. And my mind recalls Egypt, a tale of grains of wheat. Now I have to explain. The story, what he's remembering is that a pharaoh decided that in his pyramid, he wants next to him buried grains of wheat. Pharaoh declares, inside my casket with my mummy, please put grains of wheat. 9,000 years have passed, but when the grains were sown, they blossomed in sunny stalks, row after row, full grown. In other words, 9,000 years later, the grain is found, planted, and you have a blossom of stalks. Perhaps these words will endure and live to see the light bloom, and live in the destern, and in the destern hour will unexpectedly bloom. And like the primeval grain that turned into a stalk, the words will nourish, the words will belong to the people in its eternal walk. In other words, the end is, I believe someday these things will be discovered and they will nourish the people. Um, in other words, simpler way to put it is, I am not burying papers and books. I am planting them and they will blossom. Another way books are saved is with, through non-Jewish friends. Anna Shemaitya is a was a librarian from Vilnius University Library, a ethnic Lithuanian, but she knew members of the group, uh, several of them who visited her, who were readers at the university library. Um, during the lunch hour, she comes to the work site, takes books and papers, hides them in her home, hides them in other places in the city. She also does another thing. She goes into the Vilna ghetto many times. Now you may ask, how did she get into the Vilna ghetto? Very simple. She also lies to the guards. She goes over to the guards and says, I am a librarian at Vilnius University Library. The ghetto maintenance have books from the library, overdue books. I have to go in to collect the overdue books. And they let her in, and she goes in. When she goes in, she delivers food, she delivers letters, she takes out letters, and often she takes out papers, booklets, um, from Sutskadar and Schmerke. One time, she takes out 
Um, toward the end of the ghetto, she takes out under her coat a girl, a 10-year-old girl who she hides in her home. Uh, that girl survived. Uh, Anna Shemaita is was one of the uh, earliest people to be recognized as a righteous Gentile by uh, Yad Hashem in Israel in the 1960s. Okay, I have to move the story on. Uh, Shmerke and Sutzkever survive. They leave the ghetto before it is liquidated in uh, early September 1943. Through the sewage system, they go into the forests. They join partisans against uh, uh, partisan brigades, and both of them survive. The two heads of this brigade, the librarian Crook and the scholar Kamenovich, both perish. They, lead, they are deported um, toward the end. With the liquidation of the only ghetto, they end up in camps in Estonia, uh, Kluga, uh, where uh, they both died. Most members of this brigade perished. Of the 20, about 15 perished. And uh, the two poets come back to Vilna with the Red Army, shortly after the Red Army, uh, in July 1944, just like David Vaisson, who's also the, uh, uh, the Red Army came in July, uh, in Vilna also July 44, they find the, the, the town in ruins, especially the Jewish quarter, this is the synagogue of the Vilna government, and they come back, they're not looking for family or friends, they know that they're not going to find family or friends, they're not coming back to find property or anything like that. They're coming back for the books and papers they have hidden. Um, <clears throat> the building of Evo is destroyed. Uh, nothing is left of its uh, collections. Uh, but they do find a lot. The bunker in the ghetto um, was intact. Whatever was hidden in that bunker um, was found. Uh, and you can see also sculptures and artwork uh, that's Sutskira, the poet on the left, who is, um, what, they're both leading this retrieval operation. Uh, Torah scrolls, things of, of that sort. And here you can see a lot of sculpture, a lot of art, a lot of um, volumes of um, newspapers. And they create together in Two weeks after the Red Army comes in, July 26th, a Jewish museum in Vilna. It is, um, first it is in their apartment, literally in their own apartment, but the apartment fills up too quickly and they need space. They have, they have, they are constantly struggling to have this institution. In other words, it is closed, it is reopened, it is closed, it is reopened. For the whole first year it is, they are fighting the authorities, now it is the Soviet authorities, to keep this museum uh, open. They do get a building. It is the same building, as I showed you on the map, of, of the ghetto library, where Crook used to work. Uh, it's actually a complex of buildings. It is the ghetto library. It is, which in front of it, in case you're curious, the only building available is in the former ghetto. Yes, many people say, we don't want to work in the ghetto. We don't want to go back to the ghetto. We want, want to walk on those streets. People will walk to work. This is in 1944-45. And they'll walk a long way because they don't want to walk through those streets. The memories are too painful. But they have no other building. And Schmerke says, no, we must take this building in the ghetto uh, so that this history remains. Uh, this is the ghetto library. This is the ghetto sports field. There was one open field in the ghetto, and it had a sports field. Uh, it was used as a sports field. Uh, next to it is the, in the ghetto prison. There's a prison in the ghetto. That's still the sports field from that side. This is the uh, prison with cells. And this is graffiti from the wall of the prison, which says in Yiddish, Morgen fiert mit uns auf Ponar. Tomorrow they're taking us to Ponar. The museum is working in the prison cells, um, and they are, okay, I'll get to see uh, so slow in a minute. They're working in the prison cells. Their greatest opponent, the person who is committed to close them down, is Mikhail Suslov, who is then head of the Lithuanian Bureau 
of the Communist Party of the uh, USSR. Suslov, besides being very brutal to the Lithuanians, was committed that Jewish culture is nationalism. Jews must assimilate. There cannot be Jewish schools, there cannot be Jewish uh, museums, libraries, only in Birabijan, in the Jewish autonomous region, anywhere else. Uh, so he is uh, the one committed to closing down the museum. Uh, they find a lot of material in unexpected places, including at the trash administration, Soyuz Util. This is material that was going to be sent away as Makulatura, but there was no time. The Germans retreated before they could send it away as Makulatura, so that uh, a lot has to be taken, uh, is found there. Then one day, the trash administration sends it away. It goes to a um, paper mill. And Schmerke tries to stop it, but there's no stopping the shipment. That's a very important moment because Schmerke realizes this material is endangered in Soviet Lithuania. It is not only, yes, it was endangered in Germany, under the Germans, but it's now endangered in the Soviet Union because tons of material was sent away as trash. And then, by the way, also censorship and other agencies come in and say to them, you have a museum, but you realize you cannot show these books to anybody. They have not passed censorship. You can, so this, this is a closed collection. You cannot show it to anyone. And that is when Schmerke decides, they both decide, they must rescue the papers and books again. They must smuggle them out of the Soviet Union. Uh, since they were citizens of Poland, they had the right to repatriate to Poland. Vilna was Poland, so they, they take advantage of the repatriation, but not only to save themselves, but they are planning, first of all, they send with friends, a lot of friends take a little bit here, a little bit there, also false bottoms to suitcases, and through other means, I won't go in through all the means, they take out a lot of material to Poland. Then in Poland, there uh, is a lot of, the instability in Poland after the war is well known, and there are a lot of attacks on Jews, a lot, the most famous one being the pogrom in Kelts, Kelts in July 1946. And the, the two poets again decide, we can't leave the material here in Poland. We have to leave with the material um, from Poland. Again, mainly with the help of uh, the Bricha, the underground immigration movement to Palestine, the underground movement to get Jews out to Palestine, they get the material out of Poland, and they have visas in Paris. Yes, Paris is nice. And they both publish books in Paris. These are two of Schmerke's books published in Paris. Eventually, they will decide, well, they sort of disagree, but they mainly agree. Overwhelmingly, the material is sent to New York, to Yivo, because uh, the, the Yivo in Vilna had rebuilt itself in America, and they send the material to Yivo in New York. But Sutskever holds on to a lot of material. He will eventually settle in Israel, Palestine, Israel, and he will take with himself a lot of the material to Israel. Uh, most goes to America, um, some goes to Israel. A lot remains in Lithuania, of course. They can't take everything out. Just for a moment, back to Rachel Akrinsky. Rachel Akrinsky reunites with her daughter in Poland. Uh, the nanny, a Polish nanny, also had the right to repatriate to Poland. She takes the girl back to Poland, and then uh, Łódź, in Lodz, uh, Rachel begins the difficult job of rebuilding a relationship with this girl and becoming again her mother. Uh, Rachel, okay, uh, that's the quick version of the story. The Jewish Museum will be closed down in 1949. All of its collections will end up in different Lithuanian repositories. Most of the books will be all in the Litovska Knishna Palata. 
Jewish Vilna is utterly destroyed. The great synagogue is demolished. The old cemetery is demolished. And the books remain here in this uh, St. George's Church, now the Chranilish, the uh, repository of the Lithuanian uh, book chamber. They remain here for 40 years, from 1949 until my group came in 1989. Uh, they were hidden there in a mountain of material by the director, Antanas Ulpis. Last topic, and then I will uh, finish. You may be wondering what happened to the material that was sent to Germany. Well, Frankfurt, where the Institut zur Forschung der Judenfrage was located, Frankfurt was in the American zone of occupied Germany. Not the Soviet zone, not the British zone, the American zone. This was very fortunate. So uh, the Americans find, actually the Americans found three million books, uh, looted books by the Germans. About half of them were Judaica, one and a half million Jewish books, one and a half were other kinds of books. And the Americans create this enormous depot uh, just for the looted books um, in Offenbach, right near, which is really now today, for the same as Frankfurt. Um, and they begin a difficult process of restitution. The question is, what to do with these books from Vilma? And there are three, uh, uh, one of the options is, well, you sell them back to Vilmius. But this is Soviet Vilmius. And the Americans consider it, because the Americans do restitute. Books stolen from Kiev and from Kharkiv are sent back by the Americans to Kiev and Kharkiv. But they don't recognize so Vilnius, the Baltics, as part of the Soviet Union. So they don't send it back to the Soviet Union in the end, after considering it. The other option is, well, send it to Poland. You know, this institute was in Poland before the war. Uh, it shouldn't it go back to Poland? Because the restitution policy at the time is you return property to its country of origin. Uh, they consider that and finally decide not to send it to Poland. They end up sending this material to Yibo in New York, which acquired both books and archives of its pre-war collections. So that, Kalmanovich was right. When Kalmanovich said, it will be safer in Germany and we'll get it back, he was right. Now, this is Yibo unpacking the crates of books in 1947. Okay, some examples. What was rescued? Just to wrap up. A diary by Theodore Herzl in the 1880s. Uh, when he's still a young man, before he became the founder of Zionism. Uh, the record book of the synagogue of the Vilna Gong. This is a record book that spans 150 years. In other words, its first records are from the 1750s, and its last records are around World War I. Some rare and peculiar books, like a medical manual from 1843, or a prayer for women who are in the middle of childbirth, giving birth. What, should, what prayers women should say as they are giving birth for an easier childbirth. These are, uh, by the way, you see where these things are. Some things are in New York. This happens to be in the National Library of Lithuania um, today. Uh, Yes, uh, they say synagogue art of all kinds. This is in the Vilna Gaon Jewish State Museum in Vilnius. A letter by the famous Yiddish writer Sholom Aleichem in New York. Yes, the artwork. This bust of Jan Tolstoy by this Russian Jewish uh, um, sculptor, Ilya Ginsburg. Ginsburg was from Vilna, uh, born in Vilna, the trained in St. Petersburg. And he donated this to an institution in Vilna. Uh, after the war, this was taken by the Russians to Moscow. Of course, it shouldn't stay in Vilnius, and it's at the Tolstoy Museum in Moscow today. Uh, some other just examples. This is from the ghetto. Uh, there was a symphony orchestra in the Vilna ghetto. Not only a library, but also a musical culture. This is a program 
of a concert of the Ghetto Symphony Orchestra. This is in uh, the National Library of Israel. And also, you have the records of the partisan organization in the ghetto. This is a call to arms um, from the uh, partisans of the Vilna ghetto, also in Israel. Last, what happened to our, the main heroes? Sutzkiller settled in Israel. He became the greatest Yiddish poet of the 20th century. He won Israel's most uh, greatest prize, the Israel Prize for Literature in 1986, uh, and fell in love with Israel. Kaczerginski, no longer a communist, he had long given up on the Soviet Union and communism, eventually settled in Argentina. He headed an organization for Jewish culture in Argentina. He said, I know what it means to be committed to culture. I learned that uh, working in this brigade in the ghetto. Uh, tragically, he died in an airplane crash in 1954. In other words, he survived the ghetto, he survived Stalin and the Soviet Union, he got out in time, uh, but then, you know, in a fluke accident, and he died in an airplane crash. So I think uh, this is a book, really, of an inspiring story of commitment to books, commitment to culture, and of a kind of different kind of heroism. We have to look for other kinds of heroes, not only military heroes. All of us do. And uh, there are heroes both in, uh, in the Holocaust and in all chapters of people who do amazing things um, for humanity uh, under difficult circumstances. And uh, though the story has many intellectual, analytic aspects, I really tell it as a great story of heroism one that hasn't been known and hasn't been told, and uh, I hope one that will inspire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an interesting story and really great research. So now, now we are opening the floor for questions and discussion. We can ask questions in Ukrainian and so Russian. We can ask questions in Ukrainian and English, joint Russian. So we can ask questions. You are free to. So maybe for a start, I'm going to ask the first question. Would it be okay? So my question is related to the word which you used to uh, for the title of the lecture with the smuggling, smuggler or smuggling. This is the, the word which normally has, uh, has some pejorative connotations. Well, in this story, which is absolutely an extraordinary story, it attaches a certain interest and a certain positive coloring to this word. Was it your idea to present the word in the title and to delineate this process in that way? Or were the, 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 well, the very rescuers, the people who used the term, and you could find it in some sources? So is it your coinage, or is it the proposal of the publishing house? Uh, okay. um, okay. 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 I have to talk about that. Of course. It's just simply a dramatic and simple word that attracts interest. I won't deny that. Um, though I could have called it the book rescuers, I guess. But I will say this, the, they are aware that they are, technically speaking, stealing property from their workplace. And they don't use the words we smuggle, but they do talk about stealing in quotation marks. because. Just like any worker working in a, any kind of other work site was not allowed to steal, I don't know, metallic objects or, um, you know, if working in a kitchen can't steal food, they are stealing property. But so I do use the word, we stole it from the Germans, but always in quotation marks because obviously the real, they are not the real thieves, you know, it is. Paul and the others who are, are um, the thieves. 
Um, but uh, there is a technical, there were technical illegalities. Also when they, of course, you realize, when they take things across the Soviet-Polish border, uh, they, this will be discovered after they leave, right? Soviets will complain. You stole the property of a Soviet museum. This belonged to the Jewish Museum of Vilnius, which is a state museum. You are thieves. In fact, communists in the West and anywhere will write articles attacking them, saying these are not rescued, but these are thieves. They should be ashamed of themselves. They took a salary from the Soviet state institution and then looted it. So the term, though they don't seriously apply it to themselves, other people do call them and consider them thieves. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for this really um, extremely fascinating story. Um, could you say something about the sources? I was hoping somebody would ask. Yeah, <laughs> typical question of a historian. Um, and the second question would be, I didn't quite get, um, there were these several institutions which had books, which were libraries or research institutes. Do they all come together um, and build this um, uh, corpus of books which then travel around and mostly end in New York or whatever. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is the same. Okay. Um, uh, the sources, that's the term, that interesting question. Okay, so the, some of the heroes who perished wrote diaries in the Vilna Ghetto. So I have the diaries of Krok and Kalmanovic, the two leaders of this brigade, which were discovered and rescued, actually, by those who survived. So I have the ghetto diaries. The those who survived write memoirs. I have their memoirs. Of course, there's a lot of, okay, let me go on. Of course, uh, I did use the archive of the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter like Rosenberg. The Rosenberg Stab, which, surprisingly, maybe for you, is in Kiev. There's a large ERR archival collection in Kiev. Uh, which covers not only Ukraine and Kiev, but it happens to be, it, it's probably, it is a collection taken from Germany by the Soviets back to the Soviet Union. It's a trophy collection. So the Einsatzstadt Rosenberg archive was very interesting to see this story from Paul's perspective and the others in the group, writing memos back to Berlin. Um, then the post-war, since this Jewish Museum was an official institution, you know, I could look at the records of the, what was it called? Committee for the Affairs of Scientific, which was in charge of all museums. So I can see the record, the official Soviet records about this museum. So I can see the record, the official Soviet records about this museum. Then I've got lots of letters. I mean, Schmerker writes love letters to Rachel Akrinsky. I have his love letters. Um, and the letters between the heroes. Uh, so it was a mix. That was the most exciting thing for me. Of uh, all these different type of sources, that some of which are uh, in Israel, some of which are in New York, some of which are in Kiev, some, many of which are in Vilnius. So that was the, you know, as the historian, the research jigsaw puzzle was, was a lot of uh, fun. Um, after your other question was, ah, uh, um, uh, yes. Basically, to make us, there were many libraries, as you understood, from Jewish libraries in Vienna before the war. And they all end up, well, in parts of them in Germany, right, in Offenbach. And if I understand your question correctly, I'm just saying, America made an exception in this case. It recognized this YIVO Institute as a kind of survivor institution from Jewish Vilna. The only Jewish, a refugee survivor institution. It had transferred its headquarters from Vilna to New York in 1940. And it therefore recognized it as the heir, not only of its own books and papers, 
but even of the, as the heir of the books and papers of other Jewish libraries and collections from Vienna. And, and again, you might say they broke all the rules of international law. International law says you return property to its country of origin. But in this case, first of all, they said we have a direct heir. The YIVO material belongs to YIVO, and it moved. It is now in New York. And the other things, it is the, if not the legal heir, it is the moral heir. So, uh, so they did send books from this community library, the Strashun Library. 20,000 books from the Strashun Library. First were sent by Paul to Germany, and then were sent by the Americans to New York. That's right. Even though technically they were not the property of the Eagle, they were the property of the defunct Strashun Library. Maybe just a follow-up question. Uh, do you have any you know, original catalogs of these uh, libraries? Do they um, survive? So it, do you get an idea how much was actually saved and how much was lost? 25. If I can just about numbers. Numbers. <laughs> numbers. <laughs> no, do we have the best numbers when it comes to this Strashun communal library? Because we know that it had between 40 and 50,000 books before the war. In, for Hebrew and Yiddish, that's a lot of books. Um, uh, uh, remarkably, because it was a famous library, almost the entire collection survived. That is, either it was sent to Germany, because it was well known to Paul and he knew about it, or it was hidden um, by this paper brigade. Because we have today 20,000 in New York, and between 10 and 15,000 in the Illinois. So that's an unusual case where a collection is almost entirely still existing. Um, with YIVO, I don't have numbers, only proportions. The vast majority of the library and archive did not survive. The vast majority did not survive. Of, um, and uh, Schmerke made an estimate, it's only an estimate, he's not a scholar, but he made an estimate. He, he simply says, the vast majority was destroyed, a small part went to Germany, and a very small part was rescued by us. So this is really a moral state. This is not about, and let me clarify another thing, uh, you know, just to be clear. Many of the books rescued are not unique. It's not like if they had not rescued it, there would not be a copy of that book anywhere in the world. There are some cases like that, but the vast majority of books that they rescued, uh, whether it's in New York or in Vilnius, there are other copies. So it's, I do not consider this story, you know, a great, archives is a different matter. The archives that survived, they are unique. And that is, they survived usually in Germany. So, but the books that they rescued, it's not so much that the books were saved for scholarship, because there was another copy somewhere else in the world. Books get printed in thousands of copies. So it's more a story, it's a moral victory. It is mainly about the moral victory. It's not about the great achievement for scholarship that these uh, uh, unique books were saved. I have three short questions. I have three, three short questions to you. So my quest, first question is whether the Germans brought Judaics uh, from the regions to Vilnius, to one library in Vilnius, from the periphery, because I guess that in other towns of the occupied Lithuania, they also got, had Jewish collections, and since there was a special commission created, so I guess that there were special, specialists appointed who would bring that there. The next question is a little bit different, of a different aspect, and it refers more to uh, your most interesting moment when you mentioned the uh, Lithuanian lady, the Polish lady, and I, I just had a question. And did it have any imprint on the life of the Jewish, of the ghetto, that there was a conflict between the Polish guys and the Lithuanian guys. I mean, were not Jewish people uh, forced to come into agreement with the Polish side, with the Lithuanian side, to save something, to try to rescue something? 
And the third question is more related to the Lviv experience, because in the Lviv University library, we used to have a very nice collection of Judaics. And I only remember that uh, in the special fund, I came across special catalog. And in that, that was a separate Judaics catalog. And uh, that it appeared that not a single book out of the catalog is there. And I was explained that the books were brought, were taken to Moscow. So uh, when Lesione became a part of the Soviet Union, were some of the collections also taken from there to this, to Moscow or not? Okay, uh, thank you. What was your first question? <laughs> <laughs> so the first question was related to the peripheral areas, whether the books were taken from there to Vilnius in terms of Judaic collections. That's it. That first, I remember the first, uh, the first question was simple because the answer is yes. Uh, there were specialists in Vilnius, there were no specialists in the periphery. Um, yes, that's uh, simple. Um, Poles and Lithuanians, it's a very broad topic, but let me say it as follows. Um, the vast majority of Poles, of course, were uh, not uh, sympathetic to the German occupation. With Lithuanians, it's a much more complicated story, uh, but uh, to say, uh, but to, to uh, Anishamaitya was an old SR, Socialist Revolutionary. Uh, she was, therefore, very, you know, anti-Nazi, uh, and uh, remained uh, an SR her whole life. You know, she, so much so, let me just say that after the war she settled in Paris, she would not go back to Vilnius because it was part of the Soviet Union. For a couple of years, she lived in Israel, uh, but uh, her closest friends, actually the people who kept her alive, she was sick, and uh, people who kept her alive in the 50s and 60s were her Jewish friends. Um, so I would simply say there were, um, it is true. No, I can't say that. I must say that they had friends both among Poles and among Lithuanians. And I, I will simply say it that way. They were both. Now, some of their Lithuanian friends were communists, that's true. And some were other kinds of uh, opponents. So they didn't have to choose. You know, we will have Polish friends or we will have Lithuanian friends. Uh, they have friends from both groups. Uh, the third, uh, Moscow. Uh, what was the question about Moscow? Uh, oh, were, were any? No, the Vilnius material, the Jewish material was Jewish material is different than. Uh, oh, you say Judaica from Lviv was taken to Moscow, and are you talking about books or are you talking about art? Me. Uh, bo both. Books, books, books. Oh, me. Okay, so books. <laughs> No, I'm not aware of books being taken to Moscow. Um, I shortened this part of the lecture, but just to clarify, when the museum was liquidated in 1949, the books went to the Knizhna Palata. Shortly afterwards, 51, 52, there were orders to destroy all the Jewish books. This is the period of the campaign against cosmopolitans, shortly before the uh, Della Vraches, it's a period of Stalin, very intense state anti-Semitism. And the order was, and I've seen these, some of these orders, orders is first to remove all Jewish books from all libraries in the Soviet Union, both in original, in Yiddish, uh, and also translation. You get long lists of writers, you know, Shomalek, and so all Jewish books are removed from libraries. And, and uh, uh, the order was to destroy these books. And in general, the atmosphere was such that holding Jewish books was dangerous in these late years of late Stalinism. You have Jews who burn their, lot, their books because they're afraid that they'll be arrested for having nationalist material. Um, and let alone you have Lithuanian repositories who want to get rid of whatever Jewish material they have 
because they can be accused of being, you know, participating in a Zionist um, conspiracy. So, um, no, they don't take it to Moscow, but this Ulbis, the director of the Kishna Palata, decides to hide the books in his repository. Because he's a great book lover, and he appreciates how many books were destroyed in the war, uh, for a variety of reasons. But to answer your question, um, I'm not aware of any of these books going to Moscow. Um, they're either destroyed or they are hidden in Vilnius. Um, thank you, thank you, David, for, for your wonderful presentation. And I have a question about resistance because that's a that's a case of resistance, and uh, um, by other means or. Uh, and therefore, my two questions are, um, what were this group and these people in relation to their, to people around them who decided to resist with arms? Uh, whether that was by their choice or impossibility to or other? And then where it puts them on the post-war and later representation of the Holocaust as a, who are they? Are they a part of the resistance or are they tied? And how they got there? Have they been recognized immediately? Or that was a, a longer process of uh, placing and interpreting them? Mm. And thank you. Wow, that's a, um, you're right, this is a story about resistance. To, to take your question sequentially, in sequence, uh, both of them were participated in the underground armed resistance organization. Yes, these are poets who learn to shoot. Um, and from their perspective, these are simply two sides of the same coin. There is the armed resistance they hope to participate in. And there is the moral cultural resistances, which is we will not let you destroy our culture. And you will not let you can destroy our humanity as people who love books and love poetry. We just won't let you do that. So, uh, mo not all of them, but not everyone in this brigade belongs to the armed resistance. There's a conspiracy, in other words, some of the members belong to the armed resistance and many do not. If I can develop that, because that's interesting, the two heads of the brigade do not belong to the armed resistance. Kalmanovich, the scholar, religious believer and Zionist, says he is in a sense a pacifist. He says, Fighting the Germans with arms is going down to their level. And if Jews are anything, they should be a people that represents a higher morality. And I would rather die than, than, than kill. And he is opposed on principle to armed resistance. Uh, Crook is for our, the librarian who heads the group, is for armed resistance in principle, but he's against this organization, <laughs> this is politics, because the commander of the FBO was a communist. And he says, I will not join a resistance, that uh, armed resistance that is headed by a communist. So, you know, there are differing attitudes towards armed resistance. They are all united by this cultural, moral resistance, but they have differing attitudes towards armed resistance. Now, what was the continuation of your question? Representation. How they... Oh, representation. That's very simple. This story is not very well known. Uh, that is a very deep question. Why? It, it is... Um, and... You know, I hope, of course, it will now become well known. It is known, let me just say, to the remainder of Jews who are in Vilnius today, which is more or less like the number of Jews in Lviv today, at, at two or three thousand. And recently, just the Jewish Museum in Vilnius got 
uh, property rights to the building that was the ghetto library. And it was the ghetto library, and it was the Jewish Museum from 1944 to 19. And they planned to create a museum building in that building. So locally, there is some local memory, but this address is important. Um, I'm not gonna give a full answer why not, because it's, there's so many factors to why not. But, um, well, to, to say a little bit, the, um, I think armed fighters in all many cultures get much more attention, right? So the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is famous, and this less so. And I think you can find among Ukrainians the same phenomenon. The fighters are celebrated and the moral heroes, well, often it takes a lot longer until they are recognized, right? Um, okay, last thing, I do want to say one thing to, I must tell you, a uh, person, little personal thing. Um, one person connected with this story is still alive. He's 93 years old and he lives in New Jersey, not far from me, in New York. He was a member of the Technical Brigade. After all, he was a 17-year-old when he worked, you know, dragging boxes um, there for a few months, not forever. And uh, I become, you know, I met him four years ago. I talked about this topic. He comes up to me and he says, "You know, I worked in that brigade," and I didn't believe him. You know, because everyone in this story is, is already you know, too old to be alive. But then he tells me and tells me, and I start realizing, yes, he really worked in that brigade. He survived the Lumina Ghetto, he survived different camps. Uh, and I want to mention him, first of all, so you understand there is a living person. But also, because before I came to Lviv now, I called him up, I said, oh, I'm going to Lviv. He says, oh, Lviv. My father, of course, he says, he says, my father, his father was a businessman, had a, um, he had a branch office in Lemberg. And my father, he says, and I, I visited Lemberg when I was a little teenager, you know, in 1938. What a beautiful city, he says to me. This is now in 2017. He hasn't seen, uh, you know, David in 80 years. In 80 years. And the first thing he says to you is, what a beautiful city. Shalom na gromada. Dear community, um, it's a great pleasure for me to see that a lot of young people have come to attend this lecture. And I hope that this is going to be a kind of a lecture for you to know that the Jewish people, the Jewish community, and the old Jews have lived through a lot of things. But what our lecture has told us about the Vilna is of greatest interest. And maybe you happen to know that there used to be three cities like this in Poland. That was Vilna, Lviv, and kamenitz Podolsk. Uh, these were the cities, the town where the Polish culture was developing. Well, the Jewish culture was mostly developed in uh, Vilnius, more than in Lviv, more than in Lemberg. And, well, what, what was developed, unfortunately, was lost. Now, in Vilnius, we have a small Jewish community, but it's very small in comparison. And, uh, well, the situation there is maybe a little bit better there than here with us in, in Lviv. And uh, it's great that at least they can find one or two like one or two representatives of my nation are here um, but i would like to have more because our lecturer fish mr fishman is one of the leading scholars in judaics and i'm i'm very sorry that the representatives of my, my people don't come here and he is here already for the third time and i would like to express my gratitude to him maybe you will tell it if, uh, um, for this lecture i'd like to tell that when um, there came the period of perestroika in 1985, we used to have a writer, or rather a poetess, Irina Kalinets, in Lviv. 
And together with her, we open up the first Jewish grade in school number 35. And she told me, Boris, don't be afraid. We are Ukrainians, but we will try to develop Jewish history. And that's what really happens. It so happened that our Jews, our philosophers are somehow indifferent about the problem of development of the Jewish culture. And it would be great if we would have more lectures like this. And if, if people attended those lectures for them to know who we are, because, you know, we have different names, labels uh, for Jews, but we should nearly know what we are like. And yesterday, uh, the festival was, was launched. Um, people are coming there from Vienna, from Germany, from Israel, and they will have their songs represented there. And I can tell you that last year, there came a group from New York. That is a great band, a great specialist in Jewish songs. But when I came up to this Jewish band and asked you who knows the language which you sing in, only one of them said, well, I know a couple of words. So it means that real Jews are very few. And you are a Jew only where you can earn something and where you can you need to do something. Uh, well, there is none. So that's a pity, but I would like to finish with, the, with my uh, um, uh, gratitude. Um, he knows Russian, he knows Ukrainian, I know, and he could actually deliver lectures in Ukrainian, but but it's a tradition to have it in English because, you know, when I read often, I don't know what it is when I read any other word. Um, in, in, in the shops, for example, everything is now in English. It's great that we have a language like this, but we also have the Jewish language, which is very old, very ancient, and, uh, and Yiddish is the language which I love. And uh, whenever I have an opportunity to sing or to speak Yiddish, I do it. And I, I feel sorry that a few people know that language and that this has become a kind of a theater performance, just a song, a performance, and, and they disappear. They really don't know anything about this. So thanks once again to the lecture and thank you for coming.